Hey everybody, James here covering X-Men number one, written by Jonathan Hickman with art by Lionel Yu. And I know that everybody's saying, James, you just did this on Twitter. Why are you doing this on YouTube? I don't want to see your face twice. Well, I hope you do, uh, because I'm hopping over here to YouTube because it should give me more time to do a more in-depth review of these comics that I've been reviewing. And I'm really excited about that because I think that books such as X-Men number one really warrant a deeper discussion because of all the philosophical and narr narrative stuff that's going on. And I want to talk about it because I am a huge nerd and I'm hoping that people will want to look at me while I talk about it but we'll see I have no subscribers I'm hoping to get at least one by the end of the day and if you do subscribe I will send you a personal thank you so X-Men number one X-Men number one was written by Jonathan Hickman with art by Leno Yu, and it's a fantastic book. Um, first off, right off the bat, Yu does an absolutely amazing job with his facial work, and that's really important in a script like Hickman's, which hinges on these big emotional character close-ups. Um, the character, the camera pans right up, uh, right up to their face, and then they deliver a huge emotional line. And Yu does such a good job on his facial work, which is really important with a character like Cyclops, who only has like 20% of his face available to emote. He can really just do his lips and I guess his nose, because he's wearing a visor and a hood. But Yu somehow still pulls off these emotions and he does it really, really well. And I think he's an amazing choice for this book. And this book is going to be all about escalation and parallels between the humans and the mutants. And I'm very excited about that. That's hammered home right off the bat in the very first page where uh, Hickman starts off with a beautiful metaphor of Xavier giving Scott his glasses for the first time. And he tells Scott that he cannot just sit and close his eyes as tightly as he can because he's scared, because he can't live that way, because that's how the humans live. And I think that that's also a, a nifty bit of meta commentary on X-Men writers who were maybe afraid to push the X-Men as far as they should and push mutants as far as they should. And the whole time I was reading this book, the only thing I could think about was the teaser Marvel put out before Hickman was announced to be writing X-Men, where um, it, when two aggressive species share the same space, evolution demands adaption or dominance. And the humans and the mutants now are both adapting to try to become dominant. In the X-Men's case, they say they're trying to do it for survival, but I'm not quite sure what their ultimate end goal is, whether it's to dominate the humans or just live alone in peace. Uh, we'll have to see on that front. So right off the bat, we get some amazing action with Scott and Storm, and that was very fun. So we got the X-Men's best leader and the X-Men's second best leader, and I'll let you pick who is who. And I love the focus on these two. Scott is the focal point of this issue, um, but I love the focus on these two initially because Storm talks about how she is bringing life where there was none. And Scott kind of later echoes this and uh, talk, when talking with his dad and saying that he's going to focus on the things that make him want to live instead of focusing on the things that want him dead because that's literally everything else. So I think that's a really great narrative and pushing the X-Men uh, towards this happier state is so refreshing and it feels so great. It's going to make everything feel a lot worse uh, when it all comes crashing down, but for right now I'm really enjoying it. And then secondly, we get Magneto being absolutely revered as a god by these children. Uh, that's how I look at Magneto. So it was very nice to see kind of myself in these kids, uh, these little mutant babies, because they're all so excited. And one thing that Magneto says that stuck out to me is uh, that he's fighting so the second generation doesn't have to, and Scott and Storm are doing the same, essentially. But Scott also says at the end that uh, he knows for a fact that nothing will ever stop everything from trying to kill the mutants. He knows that. And it kind of goes back to what Moira said about the X-Men always lose. There's always going to be threats. And we start to see some of those threats emerge in this book, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, I actually have minutes now, so that's very cool. Uh, so yeah, and another thing I loved was Scott and Polaris uh, being together, and I love their kind of uh, tandem because they're both the offspring of two of the world's most important mutants. And I love that Scott is way more optimistic than Polaris is in Krakoa's mission because Scott seems either, it, it, Scott almost seems delusional at this point. He's thrown himself into uh, Xavier's mission so hard and the Krakoan mission so hard. Polaris seems a bit more reserved. She's not buying it yet. And I think that part of that is because of uh, Xavier's constant optimism for Scott and uh, Xavier's vision, but also the fact that Magneto has failed in doing the things that Krakoa is trying to do. So many times before, obviously, he's tried to create separate sanctuaries for mutants and Magneto and Polaris have watched it blow up in his face. So Polaris is not buying it yet. And I'm excited to see how far that rift goes. And I hope they get to talk more. Um, so yeah, and then at the end of the issue, the biggest bit of escalation, of course, is the fact that, uh, well, the humans firstly mutate themselves or evolving, just like, you know, uh, evolution demands adaption or dominance. So the humans are adapting because, and one thing that I really enjoy is that the mutants have made Krakoa in response to the humans. The humans feared and hated the mutants so much that they tried to isolate themselves and they had to become something different. They had to evolve into this new Krakoa and this new unified society that they have. And now the humans are escalating and they're also adapting to the human to the mutants 
new uh, way of doing things, which is to murder anybody that gets in their way. And the humans are responding to that by creating another master mold. And Hickman's really going for the second Death Star trope uh, and creating the second master mold, or so we think so far. Uh, but I'm fine with it because it gives the X-Men something to do with their very cool powers, which I love seeing. So now the humans, if they just had, if they had opened their eyes like Xavier wanted them to do uh, way back in 1963, we wouldn't be where we were. And the humans are too dumb to realize that. And they are pushing forward with their goal to exterminate all mutants. And that's only going to lead to more ex escalation by the mutant side. This will never stop. And I think that that is really what Powers of X was about, was showing that this conflict never ends. And Moira saying that the X-Men never win. I'm not quite sure how they're going to pull this off, really. I'm not sure where it ends and who it ends well for, but it seems like neither side is going to come out being okay. Um, and obviously, right at the end of the issue, spoiler alert, of course, the humans learn how to revive people, and or at least they think they do. And that's in direct response to the mutants being able to revive their fallen soldiers. So now both sides are able to create these uh, just unending zombie armies. And they're able to throw them. They can slam them at each other and see who comes out on top. And it doesn't even matter the loss of life because they can just keep doing it. And I'm really excited to see where that comes in and how that plays in. That could be an Italian book, uh, all of which I'll be reading because I'm loving the X-Men right now, which is not something that's ever happened. But yeah, so uh, X-Men number one had just a ton of really good, fun plot threads. Xavier, or uh, Cyclops and Jean sleep alone, which I think, or separate, which I think is weird. Um, I love seeing them all together. Some of the smaller moments were really good too, like the entire extended sequence of uh, Scott and his family. Boy, he's got a weird family that I don't understand, and uh, you could you could explain that to me a hundred thousand times, and I'd be like, no, I don't. But they're the, from the future past. I don't get it. But it's not important. Um, a lot of the really quieter moments in this new, happier version of the X Men is, of course, undercut with the fact that that Moira said that they never win, and that tinges everything I read. Um, it makes some of these uh, happier no moments a bit sour. And it's just a it makes for a really fun, interesting read, and I'm very excited about that. Um, so yeah, X Men number one, absolutely worth picking up if you haven't. Um, House of X and Powers of X laid so much great groundwork, so we were able to just kind of hop into X Men number one, and I think that that is hugely important to why this issue is so successful. But you should really pick it up if you haven't, and uh, please somebody subscribe to me because I'm going to do this more often. I think as long as I can get this video to upload right now. Have a great day.